Welcome back. It's Monday. We are continuing our discussions about sorting. And uh, that's, uh, that's kind of what the majority of today's uh, lesson will be all about. Uh, I did want to talk a bit about today's and tomorrow's lab. The pre-lab has been posted. Um, on, we had some mail issues last night. I'm not sure the actual like, email from Piazza went out. But um, hopefully you got a chance to look at the, look at the pre-lab if you haven't. I'll talk about that. I'll do a quick little tip of the day on something <laughs> many of you probably have never heard of called a little program called SED, S-E-D. It's actually kind of helpful for, um, for various things. We'll talk about that. And then we'll go into our three more sorts. We're going to talk about this merge sort, which is a, a fast and a relatively easy sort to understand. Then we'll talk about quick sort, which is also fast in most cases and somewhat less easy to understand, although not too bad. And then we'll talk about this other wacky sort called a radix sort, which is um, a, a very cool sort, but it's totally different than the ones we've talked about so far. It's actually not a comparison sort, which means it's different altogether than the other sorts that we've been talking about. Okay? Questions before we get going? All right, before I do anything in the lesson itself, somebody posted the other day about uh, how do I test my code in Eclipse, blah, 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 and for this homework assignment. And I figured, what we're trying to do right now, what, what you're going to have to do, or the way we're going to test your homework three is the following. I'm going to basically, let's say you're, I'm testing your selection sort. I will be, the, the script we will run to do the grading, we'll, we'll do this. It'll type selection sort, and then a less than sign, and then some file like rand10.txt. And what this means is that the input to selection sort will be the values in the text file. OK, that's how we're going to run this. Now, you can't really do that from Eclipse. Like it just, the newer versions allow you to kind of do it. It's a little hazy about the actual way to do it. So you can't do this in Eclipse very easily. So if you want to use Eclipse, the, uh, and in fact, if you want to just test in general without doing this piping in business, you can actually run this little, you can rep or amend your sorting programs to have a little uh, function in here called read list that takes in a file name, and it will just read the file name and put it into your array. You have to remove that when you're going to submit it, otherwise the provide script will fail. Um, but I figured this was, uh, if you wanted to do that, I just wrote this little thing here. And I've updated it since I wrote it. So if you copied it and it didn't work, uh, it should be working now um, without, uh, with all the little uh, includes and so forth. OK, so this will actually read into a file, uh, a read your array from a file directly instead of having to uh, pipe it in like this. Questions on that? OK, provide is up. Um, this time, provide is not really, it's, it's going to tell you whether or not your, test, your programs pass a few tests. It's not doing an extensive test. We're going to wait till after uh, everything's provided to run a whole bunch of tests on your code for timing and for um, uh, whether or not it works, et cetera, et cetera. OK? Questions on that? Yes, Mariah. Uh, is there a way, I know there's like something that will print out how long it takes. How do we get that to print out how long it takes? Oh, good question. Yeah. So if you, I shouldn't have erased this. Before this whole thing, if you just took time before that, mm -hmm. it will actually, actually it would be dot slash selection sort, right? Time dot slash selection sort, and then pipe in the thing, and it will run the, it will tell you how much time it takes. You can't really. I mean, you got to write it right. <laughs> I mean, and there's no other real way to do that. I mean, you can you can run it against, let's say, a thousand items, and then run it against ten thousand items. And if it's an n squared algorithm, it should take a hundred times as long, right? If it's an n squared out, well, there isn't any n squared algorithm. If it's n log n, you could figure out the math to to, to calculate that. But you could then then test it that way. But I'm not going to give you like typical timing because you might have written it somewhat differently, and there might be off constant factors that are off as well. Aaron, you had a comment? No. OK. All right, any other questions on that? OK. All right, so back to, uh, let's see, the heaps lab. So this week's lab is on heaps. Uh, basically, we kind of kind of do a heap sort, although we don't actually do it in place. Um, so it's, it's, uh, it's not quite the way you really do a heap sort, but it's more or less the same thing. You guys have to write three functions. You have to write the build heap, uh, which takes an array and turns of, of kind of random numbers and builds a heap out of that array. 
Okay, that does happen in place. And then, um, and then you take, uh, you have to write the remove min. Now remember, with a min heap, where's the minimum value? Always at the root. Right? So you're going to remove that one, and then you have to write the algorithm to take the last item, put it at the top, and bubble it down, or down heap it, which means you also have to write the down heap. Okay? You don't have to write up heap, and in fact, we've left it out because it's so similar to down heap that I'm not going to make you write it or give it to you. <laughs> right? um, and, you have to, uh, and, and you have to write the down heap. That one's the tricky one. I've actually written in the pre-lab the actual algorithm that will help you out with that. Last year, we had people trying to figure out the algorithm on the fly, and it's, it's a little harder to think about. Okay? Conceptually, down heap is really easy, right? You've got a, you've got a node, right? You've got, let's say you've got a, a heap like this. Whoops, what have I done? I went wrong, wrong way. <laughs> Boop, there we go. And then there. You've got a heap like this, let's say it's 3, 8, 10. Uh, 14, 12, uh, let's say uh, 43, and um, 9. Right? That's a heap. So far, so good. If we do a remove min, 3 goes, back, goes away, and we replace it with which one? 12, right? And the 12 goes there. First things first, now your heap size is one less. You have to make sure to do that first, right? And then you just downheap. Now, conceptually, downheap is easy. What are we trying to do with 12? Compare it to its children and replace it with which one? Or swap with which one? The smaller one. But the tricky part is, what if, what if, let's see if I can do this. What if it looked like just this and there was no right one? You have to make sure to take that in consideration, right? Like you only com you compare with this one. But then you don't compare to the one that's missing because there is none. So you have to think about that. And I've given you the algorithm in the pre-lab on how to go about doing that. Okay, so, um, so take a look at that. All right. The other thing about the heap to remember is the root is never at location 0. It's at location 1. Okay, don't forget that because some people get a little bit confused with that too. Okay. All right, let's see. Build heap. The unheaped array, we're already going to give that to you. Uh, we talked about, oh, build heap itself. Remember, this is tricky with build heap. Like, it's like, not tricky, but smart to say, don't start all the way at the bottom and try to maneuver things around. Just go from the heap size divided by two, down heap, go backwards, down heap, go backwards, down heap, all the way up to one. Okay, that's how you do that. This is all in the pre lab, by the way. Remove min, uh, we talked about. Remove the last item, put it at the new one, new position. And then down heap. We talked about this one too. Okay. In here, I say determine if there's a smaller child. You actually, in the algorithm, you'll see you don't really have to determine that except kind of on the fly. There's a, there, like I said, there's a very good way of doing it that, that I've showed you in the pre lab. Okay. All right. Questions on heaps at all for the lab? Do the pre lab. You'll be glad you did because the lab itself will go a lot smoother. Nathan? Uh, I would do it with loops. Yep, I would do down heap with loops. Yes. If you want to do it with a recursion, you'd have to create a private. You'll have to create a private uh, function yourself and do it. I, I guess I'm not too worried if you want to do it that way, but I would do it with loops just to get used to doing it with a loop. Ben. So, so for, um, so for the dot h and well, both of them. Um, so is he is so is the pointer heap basically a root? The pointer heap is not the root. That points to location 0. Location 1 is the root. Okay. Yeah. Right. Yeah, because it's an array. Yeah. I mean, it is a pointer to an array, but it is an array. Right. Yeah. yeah. Any other questions on heaps? OK. All right. So the little Unix tip of the day is in really small font up here. Sorry about that. It's this thing called sed, which is, called, which is a stream editor. And I just wanted to show this to you because there's lots of little functions like this built into Unix, which actually can be really helpful if you want to do stuff. Okay? Sed actually started with a, a, a terminal uh, command called ed, but they changed it to sed. And what it means is it handles streams of data. So if you pipe data in to this sed program and then pipe it out after it manipulates it in some way, then you've actually done something to the, to the file. And what it does is there's lots of different 
ways you can manipulate data using this said thing. So for instance, if you want to do a search and replace, right? Um, so let's say I had a file. Uh, let's say you guys all know, uh, you guys all know green eggs and ham, right? Dr. Seuss, right? I do not like green eggs and ham, blah, 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 right? What if you did like green eggs and ham and you didn't like blue eggs and ham, right? And you wanted to change this so that every time it said uh, green, it would now replace it to blue. Now, obviously, if you have a regular text editor, you can do a search and replace, and that's fine. But this stream editor is kind of how they did that before text editors kind of came around. What you do is you just type said, and then this, these, these commands are kind of, I think the select is S, and then I forget what G means. It means basically we're done with the selection. If you put S and then a slash or actually any other character and then the, what you want to replace and then another slash and what you want it to be replaced by and then another slash in G and pipe the files in and out, you actually get the two, you get the de details or you actually get the change made. So let's try that. Said, uh-oh, where'd it go? Ah, stop. Uh-oh, hang on. I don't know why it just closed. Uh-oh. Oh, my network's down for some reason. There it goes. Same words down for everyone else, yeah. Last night you might have noticed the, the homework servers and the emails having all sorts of weird issues. But anyway, OK. Said s slash green slash blue slash g. And if I pipe in green eggs and ham dot txt, and if I pipe it out, it will go to a file. But if I just type it like this, it will actually put, print to the screen. And now everywhere that it says, it used to say green, now it says blue. Okay, so that's how you use said. What's interesting about said is this stuff in the well. First of all, as I said, this little delimiter. What if I wanted to replace GRE slash something, right? Well, you can actually replace the delimiter. It's called with any other character. Oops. Let's say it was uh, like that. Dash dashes instead of slashes said s dash gr slash, now it will be able to pick up the fact that it wants to replace a slash. So it's kind of clever like that. Um, and it's also clever in the fact that these command, or these replacement things are what's called uh, regu a regular expression. When you get into uh, some higher level classes, in particular theory of computation, you will use regular expressions all the time. You will learn all about them. They're actually a pretty high level way of determining what a string, like what's inside of a string. It's pretty cool. We'll go into some more details about that later, but um, it's, uh, it's an interesting way of doing it. Yeah? Can you say it used to be ed, and then they changed it to said? Yeah, there still exists. Ed, ed still exists. I don't know how to exit it, though, so I'm not sure. Yeah? Um, who's they? Like, who made uh, who, Oh, good question. Who made these things? Well, so that's a kind of a long discussion. You should look up the history of Unix. But in the early mid-'70s, some people at AT&T Bell Labs created the Unix operating system. And they basically did it because every computer system had their, different, uh, their own operating system. right? And these people at AT&T Bell Labs said, hey, if we make it so that, so that all these computers have the same operating system, we can write a program for one that also runs on the other, that also runs on the other. And then they invented the C programming language to do that. And so, um, so Unix was really the first like, widespread operating system that ran on lots of different like, mainframes. And so, uh, so that's kind of where it, where it came about. But they decided this. And they, and they, they use these, this idea of piping things, have a basically have a small program that does one thing well, and then move, uh, move text between those two those programs until you get the output that you want. So it's actually kind of an interesting history about it. Yeah. OK, so that's said. You can do search and replace. Look up said. There's a billion other things you can do with it. Uh, let's see, said tutorial. If we go to said tutorial, it's probably rather long. Let's see. There we go. This is all sorts of stuff you can do with said, right? It just keeps going on and on and on and on and on, right? There's a billion things you can do with it. So take a look at that if you want to learn more about this kind of interesting program. Okay. Questions on that? Okay. All right. Let's see. That might have been the one I just went to. Yeah. Uh, regular expressions. So we'll talk more about regular expressions later. They're kind of fun. And we'll, we'll do a little tutorial on those at some point in the future. OK. Let's go into some more sorts here. Now, we've talked so far we've talked about, let's re just refresh the sorts that we already know about, right? We know about selection sort. 
right? Selection sort is good or bad? Terrible. Never use selection sort if you can help it. It's almost as bad as bubble sort, but not quite. Okay? But you're going to have to do it for this assignment, and it's really like three lines long, so it's not a hard, not a hard one to write. We know about insertion sort, which basically says find the place where the next, find the place where the next uh, integer you have goes, and move everybody over until you can plop it right in where it needs to go. Right? That's those. Th those are the two we learned about. Then we also learned about heap sort, which was the one where um, we use a heap and we basically remove from the from the heap and then put it at the end. And at the end we have a sorted array. Right? Kind of destroys the heap, but it sorts it for us. And was there any other sorts that we learned? Shell. shell sort, of course. Yeah, we learned about shell sort, which was that weird, like, uh, it was taking insertion sort and making it a little bit more um, advanced by doing insertion sorts on gaps and gap sizes and things. Okay? So those are the first, the first four we learned. Then we're going to learn three more today. Merge sort's the first one. Merge sort is this idea of having two arrays that are already sorted and then making them into one array that's the whole thing is sorted. Okay? It is a divide and conquer sort. Okay? Divide and conquer means you're going to divide it in half, divide it in half, divide it in half, and we always know when we're dividing in half, what kind of behavior are we basically looking at? Logarithmic, right? And so if we're looking at logarithmic behavior with this, we're going to it's probably going to be a pretty fast sort. You can't do better than n log n for the whole sort, but the actual inner part is logarithmic, and we'll see how that works. Okay? This is definitely one you can code recursively. You don't have to, but it works very well recursively. If you look up the actual algorithm on Wikipedia, it shows a recursive algorithm. But basically, you're merging two lists. Okay? Here's what I want you to do. Take a couple minutes, and the numbers, the, if we have list 1 being 3, 5, 11, and list 2 being 1, 8, 10, Tell me how you're going to come up with the sorted list. Kind of, kind of think about the algorithm yourself. Okay, work with the work with the neighbor. Think about the algorithm. How you're going to go from list number one being three five eleven to list number two and list number two being one eight ten. How are you going to merge them together? Because it's not that hard to do. And I think you'll be able to figure it out. So take about three or four minutes to figure that out. Okay. Who thinks they have an idea of how we're going to do this? Aaron, go ahead. Okay. So. And by the way, sorry, Aaron. By the way, I've drawn it kind of up here, and I put like these these things called cursors. Basically, they're saying, "Hey, I'm starting at both ends of this these two lists, and then this one's the one I'm going to put it into." So those are like two indices that we're storing. Two indices we're storing, sure. So You compare the two whichever at the first part of the list. Yep. And then whichever one's smaller, we add to our new list, and then we increment that cursor. There you go. Increment the add the smallest one to the new list and increment the cursor. We do know already that these two lists are already sorted. Okay, so that's why it works. Okay, so to start out this one, we look at three versus one, and which one goes down here? One, and we move this cursor over to the eight. Right? And then which ones do we compare? 3 and 8, and of course 3 goes here, we move the cursor down here, and then there, and then 5 versus 8, 5 goes down here, move the cursor over to here, and then 11 and 8, 8 goes down here, this one goes over to here, 
and then 10 and 11, 10 goes down here. And then what do we do? Cause, yeah, because this one's now off the end of the list. Anything that's left in the other list just gets tagged onto the end of your new list, and we're done. OK, so that's, merge, that's the, how you merge two lists together. Yeah, If we were to use this sort for the, the assignment, yeah. um, would, we, would we have to sort the two lists that we're putting in initially, or would we assume we'd be given? If you, would, you, you are not going to be given any list that's sorted. So we have to, we have to figure out what to do with that. That's a very that's a good question, but that, that you will see exactly how that works in a second. Ben? You, might you consider doing, you mean doing the individual, the littler ones in Social yeah, Sort? So, so say, you, say you have something that starts out with like 5 million elements. Yeah. If you put them in segments of 5, you can search for it. Yeah, that's, uh, merge sort is generally not done that way. Quick sort, a different sort is done that way. Uh, merge sort's not normally done that way because it, because it's pretty much because it's so beautiful otherwise. <laughs> I mean, it works very well without doing that. But yeah, if you got down to lists that were short enough, you probably could. It might make it a little faster to do that. And basically, if you're doing it in recursion, you'll probably, you probably might want to do that. With this, what's the space complexity here? Yeah, in this case, it's 2n, right? Now, you could do this in place, but it's gonna be, there's going to be lots of swapping back and forth that you probably don't want to do. Okay, you could do it in place. This one happens to be, you have to do this. So merge sort, as it turns out, is not the best space complexity, although it's a very fast algorithm otherwise. Okay, all right, so we just went through this, how you uh, merge two sorted lists, right? Moving the cursor over, 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 and you do that. Here's the full algorithm. So Moretta, this comes back to your idea of like, what do you do with those two lists? First, you divide the list that you're given up. First by half, then by half, then by half, then by half, then by half. Eventually, you will end up with n sublists, each with either one element, or I guess technically you could end up with no elements. But we're going to end up, all the sublists are going to end up with one element in them. Right? A single element. Is it sorted with itself? Yeah, yeah once it's sorted, like once, you start, once you've got them into pieces that are only one element long, it's sorted. Then you can merge them using this exact algorithm here. Merge, 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 merge. Okay, so it's pretty straightforward in that sense. Okay, here's the full example how we're going to do this. Okay, all right, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine elements here. So I'm purposely using one that's not divisible by two so you can see what actually happens. <coughs> okay, we do want to divide this in two. Okay, where's the place we're going to divide it? Nine divided by two. So we're going to have four on one side, five on the other. Let's just make it like that. Okay? You're just going to divide it in two, and this happens recursively. Okay? In other words, you, you have a function that basically splits things recursively. Okay? You call it on half the list and call it on the other half the list. Okay? And then these ones, the one on the left gets broken into two and two. The one on the right gets broken into two and three. Okay? And then the ones on the la- then all the ones except the last one get broken into one and one. And the last one is still two, and then it gets broken into one and one. Okay, so there's like a little off by one thing here, but it doesn't matter. Now we've got lists that are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine separate lists, all of size one. Now we can merge them. Okay, so which is the first one that gets merged, as it turns out? Well, it's actually the one farthest down, because remember, this is all kind of happening like parallel is not the right word, but it's happening in general. The one that the last like iteration through is going to be this one. So the 4 and the 0 are going to get merged together, which they would become 0 and 4, right? They're going to be swapped to 0 and 4. Then we merge everybody else. Okay, so we merge, well, actually, yeah, well, then we merge the 35 and the 86 together and the 15 and the 58. Let's see if I did that right. I'm sorry, you're right. I'm merging the 86 and the 0 and 4. Thank you. I'm merging the 86 and the 0 and 4, and then the, sorry, I, where'd my pointer go? They, they've taken it. Here it is. OK. So you're merging, right, you're merging the 86 and the 0 and the 4, and then the 58 and the 35, and the 86 and the 15, and the 99 and the 6. That's right. OK. And then they all get merged like that. In this case, actually, they all swap, swap it looks like. Except for these guys. Well, these kind of swap. And then we're just going to keep merging back up, right? The 6 and the 99 get merged with the 15 and the 86. 
35 and the 58 get merged with the 0, 486. And this is this algorithm we, took, we figured out, right? Like that. And then there's one more merge step that happens. One sec, Charlie. One more merge step that happens. Everybody gets this list of four gets merged with this list. And the arrows go all over the place here. <laughs> but that's what happens. Charlie. Um, well, not really. I mean, it's still only you're, you're it's not it's very different than an insertion sort. I mean, you are breaking it into pieces, right? And, and the pieces end up getting sorted together. And when you got down to one or, or one and one, you, those is an easy sort. And then you've got two and two. And they're also already sorted. So you don't have to, like you said, I mean, you don't have to necessarily go through the whole thing every time. Um, so you get a little bit of benefit out of that. But yeah, Alex? Uh -huh. Would a Q be a good option to? Would a Q? That was a different sort that you were. That I think you saw on Piazza. But um, a Q. I don't think this is a very good one for a Q. To tell you the truth, I mean this one's this one. You're going to want to create new arrays each time. That's the easiest way to do it. Unless you try to do it in place somehow, you're going to want to create new arrays each time, right? Um, but uh, but that's so basically when you break it into half, you're going to create an array of four and an array of five. And that, this is why this one has a pretty big space complexity. In that sense, yeah. So yeah, are you creating like new dynamic arrays every time? Yeah, new dynamic arrays each time. Okay. Yep. And in the recursion part, that's easy. I mean, it, it happens kind of naturally in the recursion, um, but uh, but you do have to do that. So, uh, yeah. Why isn't the space complexity greater than two n? In this case, it is greater than two n in here. Yeah. Yeah. It's two. It's it's basically uh, n. I think it's n. What would it be? It would be. So you've got. It would be basically log. 2 times n, maybe? I guess that would be it. Because each one, you've got to create a list of the size of basically the whole list. Yeah. So, so it's definitely not a space uh, happy algorithm. But it's pretty fast. And it's pretty easy to code, too. So if you want a good one to code to see how it works, this is a really good one to, uh, to kind of get a feel for these divide and conquer algorithms. OK? All right. I think, let's see. And then it's now it's sorted. And yeah, back now it's completely sorted. OK? Uh, you could do it in place. As I said, you'd have to do some weird shifting. In fact, that would be another good one for the, for the homework assignment. If you want to try to do a merge sort in place, I bet it's challenging. So why not? Uh, and then you can also, uh, this is the double storage. That's double storage per like level, I guess. Um, you don't have to shift anything. It takes double the memory for each individual piece, Okay, each individual level down you're going. Okay. Uh, worst case, time complexity, n log n. Best case, oh, n log n. That's pretty nice. None of this like degrading, or, or it doesn't degrade down to n squared behavior or anything like that. Right? So this is the first, let's see, heap sort was actually n log n, but had some weird constants in there. This one, pretty s straightforward n log n. Okay? Time complexity. But it, not, too bad a, not too bad of a sort. Okay? All right, any other questions on merge sort? As I said, that one's a pretty straightforward. It's like the, the first real divide and conquer sort we, we get to. Okay. All right. Now, let's go into this other sort. This next sort we're going to talk about is called quick sort. Okay. Uh, quick sort is one of the ones, it's, well, first of all, it's quick, <laughs> right, as you can imagine, because they called it that. Uh, and it's often faster than other types of sorts. Okay, it's a it's a very fast sort on average. Okay, it does, it's n log n, but it's a very like fast n log n. There's there's a little bit of overhead depending on how you do it, uh, but it's not too bad. However, what's interesting about quick sort is that it can actually degrade to n squared behavior. We'll talk about why that's the case. Okay, and if you if you have a list in a certain way a certain form, we'll find out quickly that it's n squared behavior, and that is not not very good, right? How do you get around that? Well, there's a couple different ways of getting around that. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Okay? Rarely occurs that you get this, though. Most of the time, you've got this nice n log n behavior, which is what you want. Okay? It's another divide and conquer algorithm, but it, the dividing and conquering is completely different than merge sort. 
Merge sort doesn't really care about the elements until they get down to a size of one. Quick sort's completely different. It starts at the top and says, let's reorder things in, in our first like divide part. Okay? And the idea is to divide the list into smaller sublists, obviously, okay, with the low elements on one side and the high elements on the other side. That's how, that's how this one works. Okay? You basically say, okay, I've got some value, I'm going to put half, or not necessarily half, but a certain number of the, the ones that are bigger than this value on one side, the ones that are smaller on the other side. And then you repeat, rinse and repeat, and that's it. Okay? Let's see how this might work. Whoa, another lot of small font in this one. So what we do is we have our list, right? And uh, let's take a list here. 1583581011585831 and 10. What you do is you pick a pivot. We might pick the 10 here to be our pivot. Okay? That pivot, picking the pivot is actually an interesting question altogether. But you pick the pivot, and then you go through the list and you say, some of those elements are going to be less than 10, some are going to be greater. Let's make new lists that, for which that's the case, right? So in this case, we'd go through. 1 is less than 10, 8 is less than 10, 5 is less than 10, and 3 is less than 10. That's one sublist, right? And then we'll have 10 in here. And then the other sublist in this case is just 11. Okay? Notice we partitioned this into basically. In this case, it's kind of like there's three lists, but you can tag the 10 on either one of those if you want to, or you can leave it independently. That's a di slightly different algorithm. And then we, now we've got two lists that are now smaller and sorted based on that pivot element. And then you just rinse and repeat, and that's quick sort. Okay? Uh, let's see. Greater than the pivot, less than the pivot. Uh, the pivot is. In this case, in the final position, we have to make it like in the middle here. And then you can do this recursively. Recursively works pretty well. You could also do it with a loop if you really wanted to. It's a little different with a loop, but you can do that. And the recursion base case is, how do you know when you've got a sorted list? Again, it's got either zero elements or one element. And if it's got one element, you know it's sorted already. Okay? And that's the base case. And if you're recursing, you say, hey, if my list is one long, goodbye, I'm returning. You don't actually do anything else. Okay. Hmm. Quick sort has a couple different possibilities here. We have one we call the naive algorithm. It's not particularly naive. It's just not as uh, as nice as the other one we're going to look at. What this basically is is kind of like merge sort. You create new lists as you go along, kind of like what I did here. Create new lists to go along, which you use additional memory for. Okay. We can do an in-place one, which I'll show you. The in place one, if I were to suggest doing any sort for the homework assignment, in place quick sort is both challenging, kind of fun to write, and also uh, uh, interesting when you, when you get down into it. So we'll, we'll see both of them. We'll go through them in this one in, uh, in enough detail. Okay? All right. So let's first do the naive, uh, the naive algorithm. Let's pick the pivot as the first element. Okay? So pick the pivot as 6, and it's going to be exactly like what I just did on the board here. OK, 6. OK, we're going to have two more lists. What's going to go in the left-hand list? 5, 3, and 4, right? And then 6 is going to kind of be in its own list. And then the ones that's to the right are the other ones that's left, 9 and 12. OK? Pretty simple, right? We've got a less than 6 list and a greater than 6 list. And we've got 6 in the middle. And then we take this one, the 5, 3, 4, and we do the whole thing again. Pick a pivot. The ones that are less than 3 and 4 or less than 5 or 3 and 4, and then nothing is greater than 3 and 4. This is where quick sort breaks down a little bit. If you pick a bad pivot, you end up with lists that don't change by more than one. Right? And that's where quick sort kind of falls down a little bit. Because if you, if you, we can, we'll figure out in a second how to arrange a list. Actually, let's just think about it. How would we arrange a list so the pivot is always the wrong value? Ah, oh, if it's already sorted, right? If it's already sorted, then, right, one, two, three, four, right? OK, I'll pick the pivot of one. Which ones are to the left of the one? None. So we've got a list of one and a list of two, three, four. And then we pick a pivot of two, and we do the exact same thing again, right? Three, four, pick a pivot of three, three, four. Notice 
This is very similar in some sense to that binary search tree that kind of goes boop, 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 one down one at a time. Not so good, right? Not such a good way to do this. So we've got to be really careful about picking that pivot. I do it up here because it's easier, right? But in many cases, easier, especially for sorted data, that's not so good. Yeah, Charlie. Good question. Is should we do an in, is order is in order check? How are you going to do an in is in order check without taking too much time? Sure, it's going to be linear. What in this one? Like yeah, yeah. No, you're you're right. Yeah, I mean, where do you draw the line? If it's in order except for one, you're still going to have to do a sort. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but well, that's true. But then, where do you draw the line? Like, that's only gonna. Let's say you have a billion elements. If 999 million 999,000 are 999 are in place, except well, I guess it would have to be eight. If all but one are in place, then you have to go do your whole sort. So you've gained something in one case and made every other test have to do an n more iterations through, right? So you gotta gotta draw the line there somewhere, like. You know, how do you, if you can come up with a good way of saying, doing some sort of, hey, how sorted is this without taking too much time, that would be awesome. I'm not sure it's possible. I'm not sure it's really possible. But it's a good idea. It's just people have, you know, you kind of just think, okay, maybe we'll try to come up with a better version of quick sort than trying to do something like, you know, that where you get a benefit, you know, not many times out of it. But that's a good idea. A lot of people have thought about those ideas too. Yeah, good question. Okay. All right, so this case, if you're picking the pivot of the left, let's find out while we're on it, what's a better way to pick the pivot? Yeah. If you pick the middle value, that's not a bad idea. Yeah, I'll show you a good way of picking the middle value in a, in a little bit. But yeah, the middle value is not a bad solution. You can certainly come up with a way that your list is sorted kind of from the middle out that's going to that's gonna screw you up there, right? But the middle value is not a bad one to do. Yeah. yeah. Take the first value, the middle value, and the last value, compare them, and whichever one is in between, that's your pivot. Oh, that's a good idea. That's a very good idea, yeah. Take the first value, the last value, and the middle value, and just take the minimum of them, or the, the one that's in the middle, or whatever. And that's probably not a bad idea. Yeah, that's another way of doing it. Yeah. Well, that's a good question. If, you have no, if your data is completely random, picking the first one is perfectly fine. Right? If your data is completely random, if you have no idea. Generally, though, data that we're given is, in many cases, already either somewhat sorted or somewhat reverse sorted, or there's some order to it already, depending on how you do it. Now, again, if you did quick sort on this value, and then let's say somewhere down the line you added one value and you wanted to resort it, well, if you do quick sort on it, it's going to take forever, because it's now more or less you know, another, uh, it's not, not in order. So we've got to think about those things. But it's a very good question. Yeah. So if you have literally random data, yeah. then, your chance, and, uh, then your chances of picking the same worst pivot every time are very slim. But if you have perfectly sorted data and your pivot is always the first one, your chances of picking the bad pivot are 100% at each iteration. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, you will get bad pivots in here, and that's just the way the, the, the way it goes. But you're right, if, if it's already sorted, you're right, if you pick the wrong straight pivot. So thinking about that, so the middle value is not a bad one. Averaging the first, middle, and, la and last is not a bad one. What's an even better one if you could find a really fast way to do it? How about this? Da -da -da -da, tell me when to stop. Stop, right? That one. Whoops, whatever, that one, right? Well, it's random. If you can figure out a good way to do random, and in fact, there's this, there's this, this uh, way of, doing, uh, of picking what we call pseudo-random numbers, which means they're not random, but they're close enough, and, and they're, they're good enough for things that don't matter as far as being really random. You can do that very fast. And you can, you can have a very fast algorithm that, that randomly basically picks the pivot. And that's a very good way to do it, because then you don't need to know what your data is. It could be sorted, it could be not sorted, it could be some weird middle sort, whatever, that, that works out. Yeah, Moretta? Um, just like thinking like practicality for the sort, like if something's already partially sorted, uh -huh. it's not the world's greatest sort for that. Depending if it's already partially sorted, it's not, depending on your pivot. Depending yeah. Uh, 
OK, um, maybe. There's not many that are way faster for already. I mean, if it's already sorted, yeah, there are some more, like insertion sort n. Got to go through one, you know, one time, right? That's not too, that's, that's the best. But it comes back to what Charlie was saying. How do we determine whether or not it's already sorted? Or even what, is, what, does, what does that mean? I mean, can we have it already sorted except by 1 or 2 or 10 or whatever? And at that point, you have to start thinking about how much time are you wasting making that determination. Keep going. Would, would you have more? Mm-hmm. Manipulations that we're doing to it are you're going to sort and then maybe add or subtract, but you're never and then you're going to like resort. So isn't it for the most part this wouldn't be the best sort to use? Yeah, this would not be the best sort to use if you're going to do exactly that. If you're going to, uh, if you're going, if you are going to add one more value and and then resort it, this is not the best one to use, right? An insertion sort or something like that would probably be much much better, right? What yeah. Would be Yeah, I mean, most of the time, either you've got re- sorted data or you've got completely random data. I mean, it just totally depends on, uh, you know, on your situation. But people have found out that quick sort works pretty well on most data. I mean, you know, when it turn- comes out, quick sort's pretty good for most data. Okay, all right. So this just keeps on continuing here, right? Uh, the three and the four, less than four is three. Now we're down to a case where there's nothing greater than four, and then five, six, and nine are already sorted in twelve. Uh, did we already sort 12? I guess this is this one as well. And it ends up being in order now. And then you just kind of stick them all back together as you unrecurse, basically. And that's that. That's, this is what we call the naive one. Okay. All right, let's do the in place quick sort. Now, this one takes a little bit of like getting used to. Now, I have to tell you one thing about this. Doing the in place quick sort, you have to get it exactly right, or you'll be off by one error, and you'll have like, 99 out of 100 things being perfectly sorted, and the one will be stuck in the middle somewhere or at the end or whatever. You have to do it right. So let's just see if we can figure out what's going on here. Okay, I'm going to pick the, the first one to pivot um, just because it's easier. When I was working on homework five myself for my own solution, um, I picked the one in the middle and then realized quickly that the easiest thing to do is pick the one in the middle and then move it to the end, swap those two Im- immediately, and then do this algorithm. It's so much easier than trying to bypass the one in the middle. You'll see. You'll see. Because it could be that, because let's say I picked 12, right? Well, this one ends up having to be on the right side of the list, or, or 9 or something. So you're going to have to move it eventually. And skipping over it is a little bit tricky if you, don't, if you aren't careful. Okay. All right, so we've picked a pivot. Here's what we do now. Okay. And in fact, this is what we're calling the, uh, this is how we would call the quicksort algorithm. Quicksort with the array, position 0 to 5. Right, the whole array. Okay, everybody got that? Okay, so we do that. Then what we do is we say we start going from the ends of the list towards the middle. Okay, we start going from the ends of the list. In fact, we start on the pivot itself. Okay, although I guess you don't have to, but later you have to be really careful if you don't. Again, follow this exactly if you're going to like write this one up. What we do is we check. We start with the right value, and we say. Is that keep going backwards until this value needs to be to the right of the pivot? In other words, bigger than the pivot. Okay. So does four need to be to the right of the pivot? No. So we go backwards. Oops. Sorry. The right moves left until the value should be to the left of the pivot. I lied. It's the other way around. This one goes this way until this value needs to be to the other side. So it is immediately needs to be on the other side of the pivot. Okay? So this one goes this way until it gets to the, that. So it's 4, so it needs to be to the, to the left of 6. And what we're going to try to do is go the other direction and find one that we can swap with it. In other words, we go back, we go the other direction and find one, the first one that needs to be to the right of the pivot, and then swap those two. You'll see how this works. It's actually really clever. Okay? So 6 does not need to be to the left of 6. You just kind of skip that one. And then 5 does not need to be to the Sorry, to the right of 6. 9 all of a sudden has to be to the right of 6. Swap these two. Okay, this is why it's in place, because we're able to swap these two. Okay, swap the 9 and the 4 and continue the algorithm. All right. They, we swapped them. Does 9 need to be to the left of 6? No. So we go right until the right one, sorry, moves left. Okay. 3 does need to be left of 6. Now we got to go the other, with the le- we go to the, r- the left one and move it the other direction. 
until it needs to be swapped. Do those two, those two are now in the position to be swapped because this one needs to be to the right of 6, and this one needs to be to the left of switch. Swap them. Okay. And then, let's see, I didn't swap them yet. There we go. Swap them. And then continue the process again. Right? And now we're going to uh, have this one keep going that way until it gets to one that's either supposed to be to the left of 6 or it crosses this one. Because once we've done that, you've met in the middle, we know we've got all the elements done. Okay? Boom. They cross. Okay? This is another clever part. Whatever this one is, swap it with this with the pivot. Okay? And now we've done that. Now take a look what we've got. Do we have our quick sort like situation here where we've gotten the pivot, everything to the left is smaller, everything to the right is bigger? In place, right? Okay. That was a little bit like it's getting those steps right is tricky. It's, it's definitely tricky, especially when you're trying to put it into a program so that everything like works, right? It's a little bit tricky. Now what we're going to do is we're going to say, OK, do quick sort on the two parts of the list now that we've got. Do the quick sort on this part and do the quick sort on this part. Or you could do it on 3, 4, 3 5, 4, or 6, 12, 9. Or you could do it on 3, 5, 4, 6, and 12, 9. In other words, you, have to, you, have to keep, you generally have to either leave the one. You could probably leave the 6 there and do it on this one and this one. You just have to be a little bit careful about it. That's all. Yeah, Charlie. If you're doing this recursively, could you, yep. would you pass in the uh, initial index and the final index and then the uh, pointer to the, the array? Yes, you would do that. In fact, we do that right here, right? In this case, I'm calling quick sort the array 0 to 3 and then 4 to 5, like that. OK? You, well. You could do it 0 to 2 because 6 is kind of already in the middle. Um, it's a, you can do that. I'm going to do it this way just for, I mean, you, you can do it that way too. It's just a little bit, it's probably one more step in this case. Yeah, because this is always going to end up being to the right of the pivot if you pick the pivot as the left or the middle, I suppose. Okay. And then, then you quick sort both of these and you're done. Okay. Right? Right moves to the left until the value should be to the left of the pivot. So 6 is going to go that way. That way, that way. In this case, we didn't actually have to move anybody. <laughs> Technically, we still have to kind of swap these two. I mean, like if you're going to follow the algorithm, these two definitely get swapped. I mean, you could make another test and say, are they the same? But, you know, if you want to, you can, right? And then uh, they cross, so we swap and so on. Okay. And the, part of the problem with doing it the the way you want to do it is because all of a sudden you end up. Well, how would you say quick sort of no values? Like you, you can, but it's harder. To, it's just a little, it gets to be a little bit harder to program. You can do it though. And then uh, anyway, and then this is the base case because it's, it's already sorted, right? And this, you perform the quicksort on the rest of this, and you perform quicksort on this one, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? That's how the in place quicksort algorithm works. Anybody want to see it again? Let's go through it one more time, just, just quickly here, to go through it one more time. All right, pick our pivot. Okay, pick a left and a right. The, start with the right one. The right one goes backwards until it gets to a value that needs to be to the left of our pivot value. Okay, it's already there. The left one starts going right until it gets to a value that needs to be to the right of the pivot. Goes all the way to 9. When that happens, you swap the two. When that happens, you swap the two. Okay, and then you repeat the process. This one, the right keeps going to the left until it gets to a value that needs to be to the left of the pivot. It only has to go to 3, as it turns out. And then the other one goes, to the, goes the other direction until it, crosses, it gets to a value that needs to be to the right of the pivot. Swap them. Okay? When you swap them, start over again. This one goes to the, the, the right one goes to the left until it gets to a value that needs to be to the left of the pivot or crosses the value it just just came to, or it crosses the left value rather. Okay, they cross, swap that value with the pivot, and you'll be in perfect position for the next iteration. Okay, that's how that works. If that's still confusing, and, it, and the first couple times you see it, this is a, a confusing algorithm for the in place part. Just go back over it and try it again, and make sure before you, if you're going to try coding this, make sure before you code it, you are 
sure of how it works, <laughs> right? Just make sure you at least understand how it works. Okay, Jean Marie, question. Yeah, it is. You don't have to touch it anymore. It just gets a little bit, yeah, you don't have to touch it anymore. It just gets a, you just have to figure out the best way to call the next iteration without including that one such that you don't break your, your next part of the quick sort. Yeah. Right, you'd be calling mine. I mean, it's not hard to do. You're basically doing a subtraction, but you just have to be a little bit careful with it. That's all. Yeah. You had a question back here. Yeah. Let's see, right here. OK, let's do it. 5, 4, 6. OK, so uh, where's my green? Blue chalk. There we go. OK. 5, 4, 6. OK, pick our pivot. OK, this is the pivot. You do our left and our right like that. The right one goes that way until it gets to a value that needs to be to the left of the pivot. OK, nope. Yup. Okay, all right, and now this is our right. Okay, this one goes this way until it either gets to one that has to be to the left of the pivot, or it gets, or, sorry, to the, it needs to go this way until it gets to one that needs to be to the right of the pivot, or it crosses. Does this one need to be to the right of five? No. Then it goes here, and all of a sudden left and right cross. So what do you do? Swap the one you're at with the pivot, and it ends up being, Four, five, six. You've got everything. This side is less. Everything the other side is greater. Okay, good. All right. Any other questions on that? That's quick sort. One of the mo one of the ones you'll always have to know about. You may get asked this in interviews. You might get asked this uh, to code it someday. It's you know it's a very good one to know, have in your back pocket. Uh, Jordan. The base case is when the right and the left cross at the pivot. That's not the base case. That's the case where in your algorithm you say swap with the pivot. That's when you swap with the pivot. And then you're done with that iteration of the recursion. You recurse again. Yeah. OK. Yeah, Mareta? Um, like when it comes to like sorts and stuff for interviews and for, like, which one, was this one the ones that caught up all of them that you said probably most common? Yeah, you will, all, you, will, you will very often find quicksort. Now, you might not have to program it, but you'll have to describe it. And somebody will say, what's quicksort all about? You'll say, well, look. Here's what you do. You pick a pivot value. And you can say, oh, look, pivoting, uh, picking pivot value is an important part because it could degrade if you pick the wrong one. We'll get to that in a minute. Then you pick that pivot, and then half the, like, part of the list goes on one side of the pivot, part of the list goes on the other side, and then you recurse through. And that's the whole algorithm. Right? And then they might say, OK, well, what's the best case performance? And you say, oh, it's n log n. And because it's a divide and conquer, et cetera. And then you say, what's the worst? And you say, oh, look, it can be n squared. And here's why. You know? So walk yourself through that. A lot of times you'll be walking through it, you won't be coding it, although they might ask you to code it. This would be a tricky one to code in an interview. I think this one in particular would be difficult to like knock right out. You can practice it, but yeah. But they might, they, they will, you know, a lot of times you will a be asked quicksort, because it really is the one that most people use. Well, you're not going to get asked about TimSort, <laughs> right? I mean, maybe you've heard of it. If you're going to a thing, that they always use Python or something. I don't know. But merge sort's another good one. Um, insertion sort, yeah, they could ask you that. But the odds are you're going to get a, a merge sort or a quick sort or some divide and conquer one. Yeah, good question. Anybody else? Questions on quicksort? OK, look at that one. This is a, a good one to have, like I said, have in your back pocket. And, and it's a good one to practice coding. It's one of those ones where you, you do it and you go, oh, that's, I'm glad I figured that out. It was a kind of painful. <laughs> right? But you can do it. We talked about this. If you pick the wrong pivot, you're in trouble, right? Leftmost one, you can end up being n squared if you are a sorted array. And so we, we, set up, we talked about choosing a random pivot or choosing the middle item. Or we didn't talk about, like, we don't, I don't have this up here, but you could definitely take like an average of two or three values. You might, you know, why not? I mean, not the, not the average, the, the middle value or something like that. Okay? Choosing the middle item is a little bit tricky, right? How do you, this is actually kind of an interesting, interesting idea. Let's say that I was, um, let's say that I had uh, 0 and 100. How might I normally pick the middle value from there? The indexes. These are indexes. How am I going to normally pick the index value that's in the middle of two values? Average them, right? Which is what? 0 plus 100 divided by 2? OK, that would work. There's a problem with that. 
right? This is actually a problem that goes down to a little bit of like computer architecture kind of problem. Nathan, what do you think? I would go with left plus right um, parentheses, right minus left, and parentheses over two. Yes, you would go that. Why? Because that would keep your number always inside your array. Yeah, well, keeping your number inside the array is, is not necessarily important because you're not going to ever use the one outside the number. But more importantly, OK, how many people know a regular integer on a, a, the computer you use, a regular integer has 32 bits in it, generally. Sometimes they're 64, but they're generally still these days. An int right, is 32 bits, which means there's 2 to the 32 possible numbers that you can represent, okay? which means 0 all the way up to, anyone know what 2 to the 32 happens to be, roughly? 4 billion, right? 4 billion numbers. Now, what if you had an array that was 3.5 billion numbers long? Right? OK? 3.5 billion, and you wanted to, uh, and you, well, let's see, and you wanted to find the middle between 3.5 billion, or between like, I don't know, 2 billion and 3.5 billion. What's 2 billion plus 3.5? 2 plus 3.5? is 5.5 billion, guess what? You've overflowed your integer. In other words, the minute you try to do a plus b divided by 2, you do the a plus b, and the computer says, I'm sorry, that number's too big. Right? Or converts it to a negative number, and then you're in big trouble. Right? It says, oh, I'm too big for that. Yeah, it wouldn't, in, in the 4 billion, it wouldn't actually convert it to a negative number. If it was 2 billion, if it was, if it was signed integers, it would be. Yeah, that's a good, good point. But yeah, so you can't just add and take an average like that. It just turns out that you can't do that. So this is a better way to do it. As, as Nathan said, left plus right minus left, that will never be bigger than right, because you're subtracting out a positive number. right? And then you're dividing it by 2, and then you're adding left. That will always end up with the middle value without making a number go above the maximum number. Well, it's a little clever if I do that. Okay. All right, any other questions on that? Quick sort. Yes. Wait, when you were saying before, when you, when you were choosing the middle value yeah. in place, so yeah. you choose the middle value. Choose the middle value. The first one, and then just go exactly like that. Yeah, I would, the way I, when I, when I coded it up, I'd pick the middle value, swap it with the first one, and then, and then do the quick sort exactly the same. It's just, if you want to figure it out, great. I wasn't in the mood to try to figure out how to swap, skip the pivot when I'm walking through the values, because that needs to be the last thing that gets swapped. Mm -hmm. So you can do it, it's just not, not, like the most intuitive thing in the world. So if you don't need to, one extra swap's not going to kill you. OK? All right. Now, uh, yeah, Ben? You say left and right. You mean on the far left and the far right of the array? Far left and far right of the array. Of whatever portion of the array you're working on, I should say. Regardless of their value? Yeah. OK. Yeah. OK. Complexity here. Best case, n log n. Worst case, ooh, n squared. That hurts. Right? But that's OK. Average. Most of the time, not even just average, like most of the time, you're going to get n log n, and it's going to be a very fast n log n. Space complexity, uh, either extra, actually per level, I guess you'd probably have to, let me think about this. No, I guess you wouldn't have to do per level extra. You'd, you'd be basically the one more extra set of numbers. Or in place, you just have to be clever about the in place like we did. right? And there's also, if you're doing recursion, you also kind of get a little, another, uh, log n behavior uh, in terms of space because of the overhead of recursion. Okay, this is one of the reasons that quicksort is normally implemented where you have a um, where you have the when the numbers get small or when the arrays get small enough, you do an insertion sort because there is this overhead. So if you have small enough arrays, just do an insertion sort on those. Okay, let's see. There was one other thing I wanted to talk about with quicksort. Uh, the the quicksort performs worst when you have a very interesting uh, scenario. Visualization, let's see. Sorting visualization. Let's see if this is the one. Remember the other day I showed you, um, hopefully this will be the one. Yeah, this one. Remember I showed you this one the other day? Let me move the board down a bit. OK. Boop. Remember this one where we talked about a few unique ones? And I said, well, some sorts don't work so well where you only have, like, well, they don't, it doesn't show it. You know, a few different numbers that are all like repeated a number of times, and you're trying to sort the whole list. 
right? Take a look at quick sorts behavior in that situation. Right? Really terrible, right? Really terrible if you do that. And let's think about the reason why. Can somebody think about the reason why this might be the case for this situation? Why picking an average value here, even any, any pivot is going to be terrible. What are you, Charlie? Your pivots are going to be repeating themselves. And if your pivots are repeating themselves, you're not gaining much on the, on the algorithm, right? You're also, you know, you, you're also basically shifting the same number back and forth and back and forth and back and forth a lot of times, or kind of leaving it in place. But either way, you're not going to, do a, not going to have a very good time of it, right? Trying to sort something that's got lots of duplicates in it. Okay? There is another algorithm called Quick3, which is really clever. Right? And Quick3, I believe, works much faster on the, oh, hey guys, why are you doing this to me? There we go. Quick3 actually works really much faster. Boom. <laughs> right? It's already done. Quick3 goes through and says, hey, duplicates, I'm going to take care of you right up front. I'm going to take care of the duplicates and then put them in their own special like, third array and say, or, or separate array to the actual two. So that's why it's called Quick3, because there's three partitions instead of two. You've got a partition of greater than, less than, and in the middle or greater than, less than, and in the middle, which is uh, kind of where the quick three does. So that's another. If you want a, like, a little extra bonus challenge, try doing a quick three for your homework, too. Okay. Let's look at some of these while, while I'm here. Merge sort. Notice, can you see how it's doing this? It's doing like, the, the merging. You could kind of tell that from there. I'll show it to you again. This one, this one looks kind of neat, right? You can see that it's doing partition, like it's partitioning it, right? Quick sort was one. There you, you can you can kind of see how it's, see how the two things are coming together, which is what we talked about. This is doing it in place, and so on. Okay. Yeah, go back and look at these. Okay. So that was quick sort. The last one I want to talk about is the is a very cool and like interesting sort. It is not a comparison sort. In other words, you're not taking the two numbers and comparing them against each other. Okay, you're only comparing part of the numbers. This is like the this is the try of the sorting world. Okay, this is like that odd, very cool algorithm that is is a little bit different. Okay, not comparison. What it does is it uses these things called buckets, and it says we're going to sort elements into buckets based on the decimal place we care about at the time we're worried about it. Okay, so if we have a number like um, we have a number like 452, right? The first thing we're going to look at is the ones place, and we're going to put it into a bucket based on the ones place. How many different values can we have here? 10, because we can have 10 buckets, right? Or so we need 10 buckets. So we can have 10 buckets for, for this one. Then we're going to, after we get everybody bucketized, we're going to recombine everything, check the tens place, and then put them into 10, the 10 buckets, and then do it again and put this one into 10 buckets, OK? Kind of cool the way that works out. I will show it to you. Okay, each pass you have to do a pass based on the maximum number of digits in your uh, values. Okay, so you have to do a different pass based on the maximum number of digits in your values. Yeah. When you say um, radix is a, a comparison sort, is it because now you could, in theory, do um, you could sort alphabets? You can sort alphabets with this, yeah. You can, I mean, you can sort words with this as well. This is what Ben was asking about the other day. This is, a, this is the way you would sort an alphabet if you wanted to do it a slightly different sort. I mean, you could do a comparison just like normal, but you could do this to, com- to do it by radix, being the, the place in the word. OK? So yeah? Is there any way, like without using mod, to look at just like two, like two bits of an int, mm-hmm. something like that? Uh, is there any way to do mod? Mod's going to probably be what you want. And that's, that's, that's actually where it kills you on this. There are some times where you have to use mod. And modules is not a very fast operation, so that kind of kills you in some sense. But, but yeah, there's, uh, that's, that's probably the, the easiest way to do it. OK, uh, not a comparison sort. Buckets on each pass. The buckets are individual arrays, and you need 10 buckets for digits. You would need 26 if you're doing lowercase letters, for instance, if you're doing lowercase words. Okay. All right, here's how it works. We've got an array, and the array has all these different numbers in them. Okay? And on the first pass, okay, we do this for the first pass. We put them into the buckets based on their 
based on their least significant bit, or I guess least significant digit. In other words, the one that matters the least. If you have 500 and 501, right, the 0 and the 1 mean a lot less than the 5. Right? Because the 500 is like magnitudes bigger, right? So in this case, we start with the, with the ones place, or the units digit. 310, 130, 330, and 120 all end in 0. They go into the first bucket. Okay? The ones that go into the second bucket are the ones that end with 1. Right? Notice we haven't compared anything. We're just telling whether or not the number is, goes in a certain bucket or not. That's all, we, that's all you have to do with it. Okay. For the tens, then what you do is you rearrange these. You go this one, 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 and put them back in the array like that. Okay. And then you do it again on pass two. You now do it based on the middle number, right? The number that's in the tens digit in this case. Okay. Because the zero. 0201, 002, and 102. Notice I wrote it 002 because you have to be a little careful because the zeros are implied in a number, in the number 2. Okay? But that's it. And then these ones go here. Now we're going to resort. And guess what? This is getting more and more sorted. It doesn't really seem like it, but it's getting more sorted based on the actual digit. And then our final pass here for this one, we only need one more pass. Whoops. One more pass. And it's based on the final digit, right? And so you've got, uh, let's see, the zeros would be 0, 0, 002 and 0, 013 and 0, 023 and 0, 032, which is over here. Oop. And guess what? 2, 13, 23, 32, 102, 111, 120, 130. We've now sorted it. Wow, that's pretty cool. Charlie? Uh, is the radix sort symmetric when you start with the 100th digit and go to the smallest? Ah, good question. When you, it still works, OK? Well, I say that it works you will come up with a slightly different ordering. I'll show you in a minute. Okay, you'll see. You'll see. It, doesn't, it, won't, it won't give you the correct numerical ordering. It'll give you a slightly different one. Yeah, Alex? When we were watching that, like, the video of all the sorts, it, there were two radix sorts. One of them was LSD and one of them was MSD. Mm -hmm. what, did the, what did the LSB, not LSD, but <laughs> <laughs> the Bago sort was kind of an LSD sort. <laughs> um, uh, what do they mean? The, the significant, the least significant bit means the ones digit. The most significant would mean the hundreds digit. So hundreds versus one, right? So this would be an LSB one. Yeah, this would be LSB. Now, saying bit is a little bit disingenuous. It's least significant. It is kind of LSD and digit in that sense, right? <laughs> least significant digit, and least, but, but we call it least significant bit because when you're doing, uh, you're, you're, you, you can do it with powers of two if you want as well. Yeah, good question. Yeah, Logan, and then Yanni? So, so at a computer level, you might be actually working with the individual bits of the integer. Right. You could do an individual bits as well. Yeah. Yeah. Good question. Yeah. So how if you if all the numbers are the hundreds and then one of the numbers two, how would you uh, sort them by the hundreds? You wouldn't be using a box like this. I picked the numbers perfectly so they fit into this space. You would have one number being in the zeros and then everybody else being in the threes out here, right? Which is an interesting idea. Like, how do you? What's the a good structure to use for this? I mentioned this on Piazza when somebody asked about it. Turns out, do you know? Yeah. yeah. Guess. What's your guess? I was going to say like an array of arrays. Uh, an array of arrays. Not a bad guess. Turns out it's actually a queue because you just want to stick a number of values in and then you want to grab them from the first one in becomes the first one back out so it can go up to the thing, you see? So this one goes in, this one goes in, this one goes in, this one, in, this one comes out, this one comes out, this one comes out, this one comes out. That's the difference there. Yeah. Why and then, Aaron. Oh, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, um, yeah, it does, you're, you're right. I mean, it, you could use an array. It's, it's just, like a Q is nice because it's just, it's built for you and it does all the expanding and moving and, you know, whatever you need to do that. And if it's, if it's circular, you don't even use as much space. Yeah, Morgan? So if we were to use, like, an array of keys, we have to, like, uh, code that whole data structure behind for this assignment? Or could we, like, pull a queue from the standard library? You can't you pull a queue from a standard library. I'm not going to let you do that. But, but you can repurpose the queue from two assignments ago, which would work great for it. I mean, you could, you know, so yeah, that one wouldn't, wouldn't be too bad to do. Yeah. Yep. How efficient is this? Yeah, good question. That's coming up here, right? I'm going to show it to you in a second, but time complexity is a little bit weird. In some sense, you can think of the time complexity as being order 
the number of digits times the number of numbers you have. Because you can think about it and you go, OK, I need to do the number of digits, right? And I need to do that many, I need to look at every single number in my list for that number of digits, right? This is actually better than n log n. And you go, whoa, wait a minute. If it's better than n log n, why are we even caring about any of the other sorts? Well, turns out that a lot of data you can't necessarily sort by radixes, number one. And number two, um, the space complexity is a little odd too, right? Because you kind of you gotta have these expanding array and like queues and things. So it's a little bit a little bit interesting, right? I mean there's there's you know the space complexity is a little odd. But you can, you can do this. Now, as somebody mentioned earlier, you do have to, yeah, sorry, Aaron mentioned it, you do have to do this modulus operator to figure out which digit is which. Like you have to basically, to figure out what this, this digit is, like you have to do an operation to figure that out. You can't just say, oh, the middle digit, right? Like you have to figure that out. It takes a little time to do that. So you end up losing a little bit in that sense. Yeah. Let's, let's, let's just look at it real quick. OK, they are, first of all, you take them all and you, you put them in. Now look, the zeros, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, 2, 2, 2, 2, 3, 3, 3, right? OK, so now they are sorted by that least significant digit. So far, so good. Then you do it again. Those ones don't go out of sort relative to each other because you're going to go through the list the same way. So relative to each other, they stay. It's kind of like shell sort in that sense. Right? In the sense that now they're not going, they're not going, like notice the, so up there. the zero one comes before, well, I guess it, you know, in this sense, they're, they're, they're not really, they're not out of place in the big, big picture. <laughs> right? And then yeah. the last one they go back in in, in, the, yeah. in the final case. Yeah. How do you know how to add the three uh, You do, right. You have to know what your biggest one is. Okay. Like you have to know which one your biggest number is. You have to either find max or in the first pass you find max. I mean, you know, keep do, you can do it on the first pass. Yeah, I mean, you just have to know you have to know that. Yeah, yeah. Good question. Yeah. Um, is there a, and I don't know if this would be way too complicated, but if you were to cast at the very beginning, take all your ints, cast them all to strength, <laughs> and then you can just use. Yeah. So so good question. You can't cast an int to a string. You have to convert it to a string, and that takes way too much time. Okay. Yeah. Good. Good. Good call, but. You, you don't want to do that in real life. It's way too much time. Logan, so then I'll show you this. Yeah? Just kind of shouting on that. So, but at a machine level, if you have access to the, like the, the binary int, yep. couldn't you just do the radix sort on the least significant bit and then the yes. second least, and then you, and then you wouldn't have to do a modulus operator? You would do shifting, mod, yeah, you'd be shifting back and forth. You would, you would do it. That would be much faster. Um, by the way, I have a, a friend of mine from graduate school who used radix sort on GPUs, which are parallel processors and and sorted how was it, it was a billion 32 in 32 bit integers in 1 second a billion that's how fast radix sort can work for very good data on a very good processor that's pretty quick now this gets to charlie's question right here if you do it in most significant bit first you end up instead of doing numerical sort you end up in alphabetic sort which is a little bit different if you're trying to do 1, 2, 3, 5, 7, 8, 9, 10, and you do it with most significant bit first, look what order you end up with. 1, 10, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Why are 1 and 10 next to each other? Then? Because they both begin, because they both begin. They both begin with a 1. And this is, where, this is where you have to be really careful with doing the least significant bit first or the most significant bit first. Yeah. All right. Uh, it would still do that. It would still do that. Instead of taking like the most significant digit of each, uh -huh. you take the most significant digit of any, and if it were zero for some of them, then. Oh, well, that's boy. That would be a little trickier. Hey, if you want to figure that out, go for it. That's that sounds tricky. I mean, it's, it's yeah. not, it can't be that much harder than like finding the. No, one. I think you're right. I mean, I mean, basically what you're doing is saying, you know, just order all those ones that aren't as big as the other ones first. <laughs> that's kind of what you're doing. So, Sam, did you have a question? No? OK. All right. So I did want to show you the, the other thing, but I, I won't today. You can go look at it. There's a good demonstration of using cues to do this online. OK, you can look. It's on the, uh, it is on one of these references here, this one, this reference. All right, I'll see you guys in lab.